When these worms begin consuming everything in their path, gigantic piers, ships and ferry bridges are all endangered. And if this worm is starving and there's only a tiny snail around, all that will be left of it will be the shell. Why are grotesque beings so vital to our world? Where did the iron snail originate? Why did Darwin chop up worms? How did snails acquire long-range weaponry like harpoons? Let's find out. Look and examine this creature closely. It has the characteristics of both a worm and a hammerhead shark. It's a vicious predator, too. Though the worm appears to be unharmful, have you ever noticed how forcefully the snail's body began to twist? It appears to be attempting to run away, but how can a snail run away? The victim is caught up by the worm, which then encircles it and sucks out all of its insides. An empty shell is all that's left of the snail. However, once one experiences that, one starts to wonder and ask questions. How could a seemingly harmless and soft worm carry out such an action? I'm not sure what you think of the worm, but to me, predatory animals normally don't look like that. It's one thing to discuss Venus flytraps, moray eels, cheetahs, and eagles. But worms? They have their own supervillains, though, and they live in a very violent society. The bipallium, sometimes known as the hammerhead worm, is a small 2-8 to eight inch long terrestrial predator. Some certain species can grow up to 16 inches, but this is not the subject at hand. Unlike many other worms, it has a distinct head that, depending on the type you encounter, may resemble a hammer or a mushroom. Nonetheless, this mushroom worm came up with the ideal hunting plan. First, chemoreceptors assist worms in locating prey. The sensors are extremely sensitive to many substances. The predator then locates the prey, which is typically not too difficult because the organisms it consumes are quite clumsy and leave a lot of them behind. They then push the prey before coating them in slime. That may not seem like much until you imagine yourself submerged in a thick, gooey jelly. Yep, it's similar to how the hammerhead worm's victim feels. After immobilizing the prey, the worm separates the pharynx from its body, releasing digestion enzymes and then uses cilia to suck the already digested meal into the intestines. The worm's mouth doubles as its anus when digestion is finished. Well, it's a rather versatile tool. Actually, eating animals like snails in this manner is really practical. If you've ever had oysters, you'll understand what I mean. They need to be slurped. To be honest, I don't like this, but hammerhead worms basically do the same thing. There are other snakes of the genus Perius that have achieved this ability. Some of them may begin eating snails as soon as they are born and have become professionals at this. This snake would eat first through the snail's shell before sucking out the inside. At least I hope they taste delicious, but snakes may become fairly large, right? So I don't need to tell you how big their prey can become. Worms, though, how about them? Do their victims have to be weak to resist them? Bipallium adventitium may take on prey that's more than a hundred times heavier than it is. It's like a person would simply approach an African elephant and bite on its legs in an attempt to devour it, and they would actually succeed. Other kinds of flatworms are such skilled hunters that they can consume enormous African snails. By the way, humans are attempting to combat invasive species like gigantic African snails by employing flatworms. But there is an issue. These worms don't have a particular preference for size and will consume any snail they come across. They exterminate both invasive and native species, in other words. Have you ever seen a big African snail? They're absolutely enormous. Can such large animals successfully combat some worms? Has nature made all snails feeble on purpose so that others can hunt them? Okay, perhaps, except when discussing snails with scaly feet. You might initially dismiss the iron snails as simply another odd comic book superhero, as I did the first time I heard about them, but really they are real and they do exist till today. The only known creature with iron in its bones is a mollusk called the scaly foot snail, which dwells close to the hydrothermal vents. The animal's foot is protected by specific iron-plated plates, and the three layers of its shell, the outermost of which is likewise covered in iron sulphide. The scaly foot snail's appearance appears to have been passed down from distant predecessors. Some scientists will claim that many prehistoric creatures defended themselves that way 500 million years ago. A snail may survive a predator attack absolutely undamaged because iron truly does work. A predator, like crabs, may hold onto a sturdy shell for several days without breaking it. Apparently these snails are magnetic as well. I mean it. Sources claim it to be the case. Although certain predatory snails hunting by shooting harpoons into the flesh of fish and other snails and injecting venom, 
The iron shell not only defends against crabs and withstands severe force. It's thought that the scaly foot snail's plates deflect these projectiles in a manner similar to how medieval armor deflects a spear. Hold on a moment, what do you mean by spears on snails? I figured everything out. Cone snails are a kind of predatory gastropod mollusk that has harpoons rather than spears. Their teeth were previously the source of them. The mollusks use this harpoon to inject their victim with poison, rendering it entirely helpless. They then draw the victim towards themselves using the same harpoon. By the way, humans are also dangerously vulnerable to the venom of giant cone snails. Nevertheless, they won't eat us. Cone snail venom is now known to be responsible for at least 30 human fatalities. But let's ignore the venomous mollusks and return to the worms for now. I'll probably produce a video on them sometime. They are quite interesting creatures. Now to the worms. The hammerhead worm diet is far broader than just snails. That's because they also have earthworms in there. When earthworms are caught by the hammerhead worm, they naturally start to defend themselves. But the predator utilizes its body muscles and gooey secretions to bind itself to the earthworm. Essentially, the hammerhead worm only confuses the victim, and before long, it's too late. And even though this is a very normal process, the hammerhead worm's feeding habits may be very expensive for all of us. We'll get to that eventually. Charles Darwin made the initial discovery of flatworms. He brought a number of worms aboard the ship back then, and like many scientists of the period, he started doing experiments on strange animals. Well, that was his responsibility. Darwin divided the worms in half and found that each piece began to regenerate into nearly whole creatures 25 days later. In other words, two worms emerged from one. The renowned scientist had no idea that these particular worms would soon turn into an invasive species prepared to take over the entire Earth. He was only astonished at the time, so perhaps he didn't taste the worms. But let's not deny what is clear. Cut into bits, many creatures can be exterminated, but not flatworms. Since they divide to reproduce, cutting the worm facilitates its task. Even if you cut off the creature's head, it'll just reappear as two worms and survive. In just three weeks, a piece of flatworm without a head or a tail may develop into a whole creature. Just three weeks? People's recovery times from injuries are substantially longer. Two little spots start to emerge on a bit of worm in the first week. These are the newly developed eyes. The remainder of the object continues to resemble a blob. The blob grows a new head and tail by day 12. They're both transparent. They return to their regular hue one more week later, and the worm may already be able to start eating food by the end of the third week. In other words, it has totally recovered. But you know what astonished me the most? Flatworms share their memories through their regenerating process. That is, if you remove a worm's head, you'll soon have two worms and they'll share the same memories. In order to test this, scientists trained worms in the lab to travel to a certain location in search of food before physically cutting them into pieces. It became obvious that even after such a surgery, the memories persisted. Basically, it's obvious how hammerhead worms swiftly turned into an invasive species if you take this fact into account. In the Kew Botanic Gardens on the outskirts of London, the first visiting Bipallium kiwi swarm species was found back in 1878. This land flatworm, originally from Southeast Asia, was transported there by a commercial ship and has since colonized much of the world. The worms originally took over several greenhouses and indoor gardens. Then they left the comfortable area and entered the outside air. According to scientists, the worm's capacity to reproduce by splitting is mostly responsible for its proliferation so far. Did human efforts to eradicate them actually aid the worms? That is unknown and it's not the most crucial issue at hand. Invasive organisms are dangerous not just because they reproduce quickly. Even when it comes to earthworms, they may cause devastation if they push out or eradicate local species. On the one hand, who really cares about earthworms? They simply scurry around to the ground, right? But on the other side, earthworms are responsible for the soil's current state. They continuously fertilize it, agitate it, repair it, distribute nutrients, and even remove heavy metals. Furthermore, a lot of creatures eat earthworms. Earthworms are known as the keystone species for a reason by conservationists. The entire globe will be impacted if they vanish. In fact, a mass extinction may result. Give that some thought. Worms are the basis of everything around us, and they are in danger from other worms. In a very small globe, a conflict is now taking place for the fate of our planet. Despite the fact that worms endangered people before Darwin found these creatures with hammer-like heads, I'm referring to shipworms. Think of the world in the 19th century. The majority of significant items, including ships, are built of wood. Shipworms, which are actively bivalves that consume wood, live in water, and not only consume it, they ravenously devour it. 
Shipworms were there long before humans learned to navigate the seas, yet we were the ones who spread them over the globe. Don't forget that we still build piers out of wooden piles that we drop into the ocean, providing shipworms with a meal buffet. Same thing occurred in San Francisco. According to Nature magazine, the cost of the damage that shipworms inflicted on the bay between 1917 and 1921 is approximately $25 million. That's equivalent to more than $300 million in today's money. 650 ships have sunk in the bay during the Gold Rush era. Shipworms devoured the majority of them, transforming the wood into a type of sponge. The worms weakened piles, ruined piers, and occasionally even brought down homes. Sometimes devastation happened terrifyingly fast. Every two weeks, one substantial wharf pier or ferry crossing disappeared. The fact that this conflict between humans and shipworms never actually ended is what I find most intriguing. The worms have not disappeared despite our best efforts to cure the wood, learn how to utilize various chemicals, and replace the wood with stronger materials. Even now, they still enjoy biting on any tree that falls into the lake. Let's just hope they don't learn to consume iron. See you later.